key returnees, including the outstanding running back Anthony McFarland, Antoine Brooks, a tackling machine on the defense. They did lose quite a bit in terms of production, but uh, a Maryland team that does welcome a new leader, Michael Loxley, the new head coach, of course, very familiar with Maryland, his third stint in the Terrapins program, and now taking over as the head coach coming from Alabama, was the assistant coach of the year nationally, and, and now taking the reins as the head coach in a place that is really, really special, I know, to you, Coach. Articulate for people what Maryland means to you. Man, it's uh, the fabric of who I am as a person. I mean, growing up in the DMV, as we call it now, uh, D.C. area, me, while I grew up, uh, I grew up rooting for this team. And, you know, for me to have the ability to come home and lead the flagship university of our state after growing up a big fan, you know, as I said earlier on the podium, you know, growing up in the 70s and seeing those great Maryland teams and the mid-70s and then having a chance to see the mid-80s teams that were big-time football teams in the mid-80s and then having a chance as a young coach to be a part of building what became the renaissance years for Maryland with us winning three straight years of 10 games or more. Our basketball team won a national championship and a uh, great place. And it's that's the Maryland I know. It's no great secret kind of what the formula is at Maryland, and it's exactly what you talked about. It's that DMV area that produces a ton of football talent and trying to keep a number of those kids, as many as you can, home and, and get them playing for the Terps because you can build a national championship program with that type of talent. So how do you do that? Man, you know, I, I made a mistake earlier in my career of going back there and bringing players. You know, that, if you look at the <laughs> Illinois team that Howard knows so well that uh, went to the Rose Bowl, I think we had 18 guys from the DMV on that team with Aurelius Ben and Vontae Davis, Nate Bussey, all types of really good players. And so uh, the other places I've been now still continue to come in there, and I've got to figure out <laughs> how to shut the door and lock the keys so that these guys can't get out. But, you know, I'm glad to see that the area is getting the uh, notoriety it needs because for so many years as a kid growing up there, it was known as a basketball area. And now when you look at the top teams in the country and you check their rosters, I think most of those teams will have a, a, a good amount of players or one or two really good players that are from the DMV area. And it's a challenge because we have so many people coming in there to recruit but I think with the $180 million football facility we're going to be opening up that Howard learned about <laughs> with the construction going on in the middle of our interview and the brand new indoor facility that we, we're in now and, you know, the great academics that uh, that you are able to get by going to a school like Maryland. Uh, we got a lot of good things to sell, and there's been a, a, a refreshing uh, vibe about Maryland that we've just got to continue to get the word out. Coach, tell us some things that you're doing as a staff as a result of your experience at Alabama that maybe you would not have been doing if it wasn't for that experience. Well, I mean, I, I think the big thing, I, always, I set it up there, success leaves clues. And, you know, I had a chance to be around Alabama and behind the curtains of that place. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't take a lot of the things. And probably the biggest thing that I learned is the evaluation process is really critical in recruiting. Uh, making sure you're bringing the right kind of kids that have the right kind of stuff. Um, being around Coach Saban, the messaging of how you develop your team. You know, so much is made about Alabama gets great players and, you know, like it's easy to continue to win the way we won there. But, I mean, the things that go on behind the scenes, how you feed these guys, uh, how you motivate these guys, who you have talking to them, how you train them. There's just so many things that I took from my time there. And, and not that it was broke at Maryland, but – I'm bringing some of the things that I really like. You know, there's some things I didn't like sure. that I left behind. And as you know, being in the business, you take the things that you like that work for you, you implement them, and then the things that you didn't like, you kind of leave behind and you build on those. You talked about this from the podium as well, creating a family atmosphere. Right. And, and a lot of times the fans don't get a chance to yeah. see this off-season part of it. But talk a little bit about some of the things that you as the head coach and also yeah. your assistants are doing to build that family atmosphere. Yeah, that was much needed at Maryland at this time. And I can't say that that's always the case at other places. But one of the things as a head coach, I've always prided myself on developing real meaningful relationships. And, you know, third-party validation and recruiting. When a kid <laughs> picks up the phone and talks to Vernon Davis or Adeline Davis's grandmom and she says, hey, 
I wanted Coach Locks to take Vontae Davis to church every Sunday. And you know what? For the three years Vontae was there, he went to church every Sunday. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I think it's important that you invest your time in your players. And, I mean, I, I talked about Sunday fun day. I mean, if you follow us on Twitter, I mean, the players are at my house on Sundays, and I got go-kart track, I got a pool, I got a full basketball court. And they're getting to know me outside of just being their coach, which I think – in this day and age, and what Maryland went through last year was really important to develop real meaningful relationships off the field because that's where trust is built. And when players trust you and they know you care, I've found. I mean, I, I did the same thing in Alabama. I had burger night every Thursday night where the whole offense would come to my house, watch the games on TV, and I'd flip burgers and just hang out and get to know them. And it helps that Kia and I are empty nesters, and so we like having the kids around. <laughs> but um, just – developing real meaningful relationships, having them around you and seeing you outside of just as a coach. I think that goes a long way with how they recruit for you, how they respond to you when you are getting after them as a coach. And, and when tough times happen, I think the bond and the trust is there to know that you care enough about them that we'll get through it together. You're so involved in the offense. How are you going to manage and quality control the defense? Well, uh, I had a chance for the last three years to see how the little guy <laughs> with the straw hat did it, and I'm going to tell you, I'm on the same schedule uh, that we have. And What is that schedule? Well, <laughs> it's a long one. I know. <laughs> it's a long one. What time does it start? <laughs> oh, man. But I will tell you it's efficient in that uh, I won't be really far removed because I know for a fact him being a defense, he was on the flip side of what I'm doing. Right. We had to meet with him every day to watch practice tape from the night before, the day before. I had to go in with my quality control report every Sunday, and I mean, we'd score 60 points, and I had to find reasons and ways to say we need to get better because he didn't want to hear, hey, we got it done, coach. We pat ourselves on the back. And so um, we're going to follow the same schedule that, that we had at Alabama with maybe a few tweaks here or there to where I'll know what's going on on the defensive side of the ball. Fortunately, I coached my first eight or nine years and, and played on defense, so right. uh We'll get it all watched, and we'll get it all corrected, and we'll put a product on the field that I'm very familiar with what I see. How will play calling be handled for you this first year? Well, Scotty Montgomery, who I was very fortunate to get as my offensive coordinator, man, is one of the brightest guys. I mean, unfortunately, he's a Duke grad, and he'll <laughs> let you know he's the smartest guy in the room, as you know, if you ever meet a right. Duke guy. But we're running my system, the system we ran at Alabama, uh, the same principles, and Scotty and I are – I'll, much like Coach Saban, I'll be in the room to shape the game plan all week long and be a part of building the game plan. But I have a, I have a lot of faith in Scotty as a play caller that he'll be able to play uh, to make the calls needed. I'll be there as a voice to help assist uh, with things that I see. I mean, I'd be remiss not to do that with the success we've had or I've had. And so uh, it's going to be – it'll be great. It'll work out great. But Scotty's going to call the plays, and I got a tremendous amount of uh, respect and confidence in Scotty as a play caller. Coach, I've been asking all the coaches your thoughts on the transfer portal, transferring without being penalized a year, okay. just the whole thing we're going through now with student athletes. Really yeah. interested in your perspective. Well, I, I think it's a, a double-edged sword when you throw in all the other variables you just talked about. But I think the transfer portal and its uh, – organic existence is a good thing because if players get into a situation where they're not a fit or they don't think they fit academically, athletically, or socially to have the option to transfer out. But I think where the issue becomes is managing the other side of it with us, with the scholarship numbers, uh, only being able to sign 25 and then you have attrition or you have transfer portal or guys go to the pros and now you end up with 76 guys on scholarship instead of your 85 and you can never make up the other seven or eight scholarships that you have lost. And then with the uh, free agency, as I will call it, when they don't get penalized for transferring, I think it's a mirage for other players that, hey, I'm going to get in the transfer portal and be able to play. And if, it's just been so inconsistent with who gets the uh, the immediate playing waivers, the who doesn't, the appeal. And so I just think we got to clean that part of it up because – as we're finding out, you're going to have more players in that portal that left great situations that it's a lot like musical chairs. When that music stopped, they don't have a chair to sit in. Yeah, it's a tough situation. How about at the quarterback uh, position? How's that – you see that shaping out? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm fortunate that I've just been a part of some quarterback battles the last couple of years. Last year, dealing with Jalen and Tua. Uh, people don't know the two years before – 
dealing with Jalen and the four other Elite 11 quarterbacks that were in that <laughs> meeting room. So I've got some experience in dealing with evaluating a quarterback uh, battle. But we've got five guys, three guys with experience in uh, Max Borgenschlager, Piggy, and then Josh Jackson at Virginia Tech. And then we've got two guys that don't have experience, Tyler Dessou and, and Lance Lejeune, who we signed out of Louisiana. And so I'm looking forward to seeing these guys and finally being able to get my hands on them and coach them and see how they manage the game, how they, who gives us the best chance to win, who takes care of the football, who can win on third down for us. And uh, I'm looking forward to that battle, and I'm excited about it. Other than the DMV, where are some of your primary recruiting areas? Well, we got to go, obviously, in the footprint of the Big Ten. We'll hit all the Big, Big Ten uh, areas. But we also, because of my relationships down south in Florida, now Alabama, Louisiana, uh, Atlanta, those are real primary areas for us. We'll still get into the Carolinas a little, but uh, a lot of Georgia, Florida, Alabama, that southeast corridor to go along with, obviously, the Big Ten footprint. On the defensive side, you were able to get someone in that's going to be a huge boost for that defense. Right. How, how do you see him shaping up in this defense? Yeah, you know, you talking about John Sha Hope yeah. or you talking about Shaq? Shaq. Oh, yeah. well, I'll start with John Hope, yeah. my defensive coordinator. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate to get a guy with John's experience and 16 years in the NFL as a DB coach and 30-something years as a, a coordinator at some very big-time programs. It's great to have John running the defense. That way he don't get mad at me because I gave Scotty a lot of love. <laughs> and they always say, oh, you're an offensive head coach. So <laughs> I'm glad I, I screwed that up. But, you know, Shaq Smith is another guy that comes from a, a winning program. And I go back to that saying, success leaves clues. And with Shaq and even a Keandre Jones coming from winning programs like I have, these guys are able to take some of the experiences, the behaviors and habits that they know are the, the way you want to play the game and impart it. And it's always better when it's peer to peer, mm. because as you know, raising kids, it sounds a lot better coming from little Billy's dad and mom than it does coming from me. And so hearing it from one of their brothers, you know, telling them how, how they need to do things and the habits and behaviors we need, uh, I think it helps us grow a lot faster. Yeah, Coach, it was interesting. You were talking about Scotty Montgomery earlier, a guy with head coaching experience. Joker Phillips on your staff has head coaching experience, too. Was that important to you? Did you want to have guys who had been head coaches, or is that just a coincidence? No, it was really important to me. Um, you know, having watched how Coach Friesen did it at Maryland is where I first became aware. Uh, you know, we had Charlie Taff and Gary Blackney, who were both former head coaches, uh, when we went through that three-year run of tremendous success at Maryland. And I, I thought it was important, especially after having been a head coach prior to this and, you know, maybe not having that experience in the room and other guys that have sat in that chair before to help push my messaging to where even coaching the coaches, you know, Scotty being in the offensive room and being able to tell the young assistants or other guys, like, look, this is why coach is pissed, man. Like, you don't understand. And I think, you know, it's great having that type of experience, two guys that have run major programs, Joker and his, you know, time at Kentucky. They both have been invaluable to me as I – take over the reins again as a head coach and I, I definitely lean on those guys because of their experience you were talking about your prior head coaching experience I know it didn't go the way you wanted it to what did you learn from that that you, you think <laughs> has made you a, a better coach you know I've erased that from my hard drive <laughs> I, I really have tried to but no I set it up there and I mean it I mean I've got that plaque on my wall with all the places I've coached and you know I, I, that New Mexico experience when you look at look, when I look back at it now I mean I was 30 seven years old when I got the job and I'll be 50 Christmas Day and much like you I remember when you first kind of came into the Big Ten Network <laughs> you got better with every year thank goodness thank goodness uh, but but no um, it, you learn as much from failures and losses than you do and it's harder to to evaluate or quality control yourself when you're successful but that's one of the things I learned at being in Alabama even with the success we have we really ask the tough questions why was it good well the same goes for with some of the failures you have as a coach or as a player you look back and say why did it fail why did it not work and you know I, I did that when I first uh, left New Mexico I wrote down in a journal all the things I would do differently and it, it has really helped me as I've uh 
progressed in my career and, and, and now as the, the, the head coach of the Maryland football program. Well, cool to see you get a chance to implement it and really cool to have you back in the Big Ten. I mean, yeah. we've ha obviously had a few times where we've crossed paths here in our 13 years <laughs> of doing this and, and really pleased and looking forward to working with you. Thanks a lot, Locks. Thank you, guys, man.